All right, in this video, I'm going to specifically be going over the drum tones for the counterparts upload. If you guys do want me to go over um, bass and guitar, maybe a little bit of vocals, uh, let me know in the comments and I'll gladly do a second video. But I felt like the focus of this video should be about how the drums, the way they were tuned and the way they were played made it such an easy mix for me. Um, there's been a lot of cases you know, drums on tour, they get cold, they get hot, they get beat up, they go without head changes for a while. And, you know, not every drum set sounds great going into like the raw multi-tracks. Uh, in this case, I feel like I got really lucky that I don't know if it was fresh heads or they were just tuned or if it's just because he was beating the crap out of them. Um, but they just sounded really good straight off the board. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and play you're not familiar with how it sounds yet um, just the drums with the bass and the guitar just like the full mix so that's like with toms and stuff and then here's just more like a more straightforward part So the drums are pretty punchy. They've got a good amount of attack to them uh, by themselves without any bass or guitar. I'll go back to the part with the toms. You can hear the whole kit. That's pretty much how an ideal drum set would sound for me in every mix I do. Um, Punchy, defined attack, not a ton of bleed from the cymbals and whatnot. So I'm just going to kind of dive in uh, piece by piece of the kit and go over why it was so easy to mix. All right, so straight off the board, here's what the kick drum sounds like. Uh, it's a kick in and a kick out. I don't really get that very often. Uh, at the foundry, we just have a kick out, which I sometimes put inside the kick. Uh, kick in would be a beta 91 kick out would be a beta 92 so just the kick in that's where all the attack comes from normally that's why i love the 91 so much because it has just like a really defined attack and for the most part you don't have to do a lot to it to make it sound good then the kick out. So if you're not familiar with kick in, kick out, like that combination, you can kind of figure it out just by listening. Kick in, that's where your attack comes from. Kick out, that's where you get the low end, the thump. They go together really well. All right, so just the kick in. Pretty, I mean, it's not a major boost, but you can see what I was going for. I'm using this mic for attack. So a uh, little bit of a cut to just to take like the muddiness of the kick out. There's pretty much always some kind of mid scoop involved in my kicks and uh, a pretty big boost of the top end here. So I made the kick, you know, I took the kick in took a good amount of the low end out because I'm going to get that for my kick out. So there's no reason to muddy it up with too much low end in both mics and just a tiny bit of compression here. And it looks like I did boost on the output a little bit just for volume. So the compression itself is pretty minor, but I do have the low end not getting compressed and uh, six to one. So when it is getting hit, it's getting hit pretty hard, but I am using the plugin for output gain. For the kick out, it's kind of like the opposite effect. Uh, I do leave a little bit of the attack in because it just kind of helps give it more presence. Sometimes I'll just take all the high end out of the kick out. Uh, cymbal bleed and stuff will play a factor in that, but Obviously, my goal here is to get as much low end out of the kick as possible.
and then uh, compressor. Kind of, I keep my attacks slower on my kickouts. You don't want to squish the low end too much. It starts to sound real hollow real quick if you go with too fast of an attack on low end stuff. So kick in and then I'll bring the kick out. And I just like to check when I mix them if they're out of phase with each other, if hitting this polarity flip on one of the plugins is going to help how it sounds. I know that in the final product, I did have this button pushed. You can kind of hear that it gets more punch to it. Uh, sometimes you can just use EQ to work around the phasing issues. I like to just check. You never really know. And then those two plug-in, or those two channels together go on to a kick bus where I do even further processing to it. SSL channel with some compression, some EQ, cutting the highs, cutting the very low subs. Uh, in adding even more low end. So I'm just getting even more presence in my kick, even more low end. It's just getting punchier. Um, you can definitely overdo it when you start diving into layers and layers of plugins like this. Uh, usually I'll catch myself before it gets to that point, but it is easy to get carried away. And then you start running into like well, a little bit of phasing here and there because you're just running so many plugins. Obviously noise can also play a factor in that. But the difference with this video, uh, as opposed to other ones I've done, is I did not do any parallel compression on my kick. I do that a lot, but I felt like with the two channels I was given, I was able to just get away with adding, you know, the right EQs and a little bit of compression here, a little compression there, and overall just getting the, the sound I was looking for without needing to add any parallel compression. And overall, my drum mix was a little lower volume. The whole mix itself was a little lower volume than usual. So I wasn't going crazy with layering a bunch of tracks. I was kind of just getting a solid mix with what I was given. The compressor on the kick, this is the last set of compression on the kick. 76 always sounds good to me for drums. You could argue that it sounds bigger without that. Uh, I like that it tightened up the kick a lot. You, you know, the more compression you add, you also lose a lot of dynamics. So you got to kind of find your middle ground between punchy or dynamic or tight, you know. It's, it's all to taste. Everything should always just be done to taste what sounds good to you. There's really no right or wrong answer. It's just what sounds good to you. In this case, I like how it sounded with the compression. And it uh, looks like all I did here was add even more low end. So even though the kick was very punchy, Usually these last plugins in my chain get brought in after everything else has been mixed. So I must have gotten to guitar or bass and just felt that the kick wasn't punching through as much as I wanted it to. So I just add a little bit more low end. And that actually is kind of compensating for what was lost here. So this tightened it up, and then this brought the punch back. And as far as what frequency you boost on a kick, just kind of sweep through and find what sounds right for that specific drum. It's going to change based on tuning, what head was used, where the mic was at, uh, what wood the drum is made out of. Drums are very, they're all different. Um, so there's never really going to be a sure answer for what you want to do with EQ and stuff. It just kind of depends on the day. Like, literally, it's day-to-day. -day. All right, for the snare, we're looking at even less. Snare top without anything on it, and then with the EQ that I chose to use. Very common for me to do a boost somewhere around 200, 
both in studio and in the live application. It just makes the snare sound fatter. It's that sound you've grown accustomed to in modern metal mixing. Uh, and as far as what I'm cutting, I usually just listen for the ringing tones of the drum itself. With snare, it can be anywhere between 800 to 1K. Sometimes there's something between 300 and 500. Sometimes you don't have to do much at all. Usually there's a 1K ring somewhere in there that I like to take out at the least. And then a little bit of attack for the top head. This is stick attack. We're going to have even more high-end boosting on the bottom, and that's going to add more of the presence, but you don't want the top to sound too dull um, because otherwise it'll just sound like snare wires with a fat undertone to it. So it's good to bring out a little bit of stick attack on the top head. On my snare bottom, I do have a little bit of an expander. Uh, the snare bottom head picks up some of the kicks. It picks up some of the hi-hat and stuff, and this just cleans it up a little bit. You can also hear that the toms are making the snare wires vibrate, so this expander just helps tame that a little bit. It's nothing crazy. I mean, literally a 1.3 to 1 ratio is extremely low. Um, so, and yeah, at the most, only 8.5 dB of gain reduction, or, you know, attenuation, I should say. And then my EQ is pretty mild, actually. Taking the sub stuff out, because we don't really need it and just adding a little bit more snap to the snare wires. And the two together. And once again, you can see I had to invert polarity on one of them. I did it on the bottom. Definitely makes the snare sound fatter. Uh, those are going to a bus together where I did a little bit of EQ to the whole snare. I believe this EQ and this compression was done after I mixed the rest of the drums. I'll try to find a little bit more snare parts. So I'm bringing a little bit more life into the snare, even more of a boost at 200. This is a shelf, so I have the filter down here to kind of turn it more into a bell style EQ. Otherwise, this would be boosting everything from 200 hertz down. The filter, you know, it, as I bring it up, it turns it more into a bell shaped EQ. But, you know, it's not a ton of EQing, really nothing huge. It's just adding a little bit more life to the snare. And then I, once again, like I said, I like the CLA-76 on the kick. Uh, and toms, I really like the 2A on a snare. Just bring it up in your face a little bit more in the mix. And then uh, for the snare verb, just kind of mess around with a hall on the Renaissance verb here. And... This is usually the only drum I put verb on in my mixes. The toms don't really need the verb because when you start bringing in the vocal mics and the snare verb, they already sound pretty open enough. Without it. A uh, hi-hat isn't really always there. I think I only have a hi-hat mic about 5% of the time. I personally don't mic hi-hat in the foundry because if anything, I just want less cymbals, but the hi-hat mic was there, so I did utilize it. All I'm really doing with it is making it bright. I don't need anything in the low end. I don't need anything in the low mid, so I'm just getting as much brightness out of it as I can. When it's brought into the drum mix, it's really just making the hi-hat stand out, but it's not doing anything crazy, like it's not very loud. So it was nice to have it, but if, if I didn't have it, it would have been fine. 
but obviously since I did have it, it's nice to use and it makes the hi-hat stand out more, which considering how often the hi-hat is used in counterparts music, it works out in my favor. And uh, I'll just go over the toms very quickly. They sounded really good without any EQ, any compression. So I'll play both the toms with nothing on them. For the rack tom, rack toms usually sound pretty good as long as they're somewhat in tune and hit pretty hard. I've been liking this plugin a lot. I've been using it for toms quite a bit and snares. Um, really nothing crazy. I'm adding attack. I'm cutting out some of the sub that I don't need just to make it sound cleaner. It sounds a little muddy if you leave all the low end in there. And then just a little dip. Uh, this is this works with just fixed amount frequencies so you kind of just have to pick and choose what sounds good and that's why I like it so much it's just the shape and a frequency usually my toms end up getting quite a big boost in the attack just because once the guitars and everything else comes in they kind of get lost so when you listen to the tom by itself, it does sound pretty harsh in the attack, but in the full mix, it comes together pretty well. As far as compression, just a little bit. Um, once again, if I compress anything too much in a live mix, the bleed from everything else is just going to get intense, and the last thing I need is a ton of cymbals in my tom mics. And then for the floor tom, uh, I really like the G channel for floor toms because you get to make sure that the low end doesn't get compressed. If you use a filter and then you hit this button right here, filter to dynamic sidechain, your compressor won't filter anything below this number or above this number. So you can compress your floor toms pretty hard, but they still sound really fat. Also, I should say, this floor tom sounds really good without anything on it. Most floor toms sound like garbage when they're mic'd up at the foundry. I don't know why, just the floor toms never sound that good. They're kind of hard to tune, I know, but I just really like how this floor tom sounded. So I just made it sound more defined, a little cleaner. You know, taking out 400 hertz and then boosting wherever the attack was. I do have some of the symbols taken out. I went all the way up to uh, 14k, it looks like. And I did that by just boosting and then finding where the symbols were just bleeding in excessively and cutting it. So that's really just symbol control because floor toms usually have a ride or a china or the largest crash on the kit right above them. So if I can tame the high frequencies, I will. And even though I have a compressor here, I did have some hits that were going a little too hard and clipping. So this is just like a clip control situation. It's not audible at all. There's no makeup gain on it. It's just there to make sure that the big floor tom hits weren't uh, clipping my drum bus. So, toms with and without processing. And then one last time, uh, just all the drums all together. So hopefully that gives you guys a little bit of insight as to how I mix the drums for this. I may have pretty much explained everything I did. And you can obviously go back and pause the video on the plugins if you want to 
take a closer look at each setting. I'd rather not dive into every little cut and boost I made. I'd just rather you guys pause the video. Uh, and if you want me to go over the guitar, bass, vocals of this mix, I'll happily do another video. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I'm glad you guys liked the last one, and it gave me more incentive to do more of these. And I'll try to do a mix video after every few sets, just to like keep things changed up a little bit. Thank you guys for watching. I hope to see some of you guys in the live streams. Uh, I'm actually about to go mix straight from the path after this video is posted. So I'll see you guys soon. Thanks for watching.